Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, um, Principal Barge. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, the uh, Hayden Planetarium, where I work, has been an inspiration to me ever since I was a child, and uh, I grew up in uh, the 60s. Uh, I was born in 1961, which is when President Kennedy uh, took office and challenged us to go to the moon. Um, and some may remember, if you're old enough in the room, to remember uh, in Queens, the 1964 World's Fair, which was very inspirational. Um, this is me at Luna Park, uh, um, chasing over to my brother. And um, But this uh, inspiration, I grew up in a family of artists. My father was a commercial artist, Ogilvy and Mather, and uh, taught me how to look and see taught me how to draw, but I think what's important is that inspiration to want to draw and see. Going to the museum, my mother uh, took me to the museum on spring break. This is April 1969, so a few months before we landed on the moon, uh, July of that summer. And uh, my father uh, took these pictures of dinosaurs. I wanted to bring the exhibits home. Um, and later, when I went to college uh, in the early 1980s at the University of Colorado, and we did this Case for Mars design series. Um, we brought artists in, but uh, um, I took on the job of, of illustrating what the engineers were talking about, not just sort of vistas of Mars. What we see here are sort of technical illustrations that we did actually for a video with NASA, but uh, it shows using space shuttle components and how we might be able to reuse bits and pieces that at that point were being talked about in the future space station and repurpose them for a journey to Mars. And uh, what was exciting about that was that as students with enthusiasm about the topic was that people like Buzz Aldrin, Carl Sagan, and others, uh, former NASA Administrator Tom Payne, came and championed our cause. And uh, um, like that dancer without a shirt in the beginning, we found that just a, few, a small group of us um, started what became six conferences over about 15 years. And so this uh, series of illustrations sort of map out how we could get a team of about 15 people to Mars. Um, Buzz Aldrin um, produced this notion of a cycling vehicle. So what you see here is this big Y shape that rotates. It would rotate for artificial gravity. And so um, that uh, on the way to Mars, you would have gravity. So when you get there, you're not just, you haven't been floating around for six or eight months in transit. And so when they get to uh, Mars, this large vehicle actually comes back home from the next crew, and these um, vehicles would land. And they land where other vehicles had already been uh, landed uh, robotically, and so that you could hollow them out and actually create the sort of um, base on Mars almost immediately. But I was inspired, again, by this, this sense of what art can do in putting you there. I wanted to go. Uh, I was born, again, just during the challenge to get to the moon. I was eight years old. We walked on the moon. And I envisioned by the time I was Neil Armstrong's age, he was 39 when we walked on the moon, uh, much older than that now, but that there was a chance that I might be part of that, that mission. But uh, really, the sense of trying to illustrate the concept, it was very exciting that the engineers were coming up with to show how we do it. You have to bury yourself under rocks because Mars, unlike the Earth, does not have a magnetosphere, and so radiation is an issue. Also, inflatable greenhouses and things like this could be used to actually grow the food on the surface. Um, I built a model for the Smithsonian Museum. It's, uh, I was uh, happy to see that it was still on the wall last time I went down to the National Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington. Um, and uh, took over the entire house uh, where we were renting, uh, uh, working out at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. And there's, there's the model. And um, so all of this in purpose to really take us on a journey with the artwork, essentially, to imagine what it would be like. Buzz Aldrin and I, uh, here at the funeral of Tom Payne, who had been NASA administrator when Buzz and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and uh, this flag was something that Tom left us with. And it became part of the funeral ceremony. And I asked his grandson, who I tried to paint his likeness in this particular uh, painting, uh, the, plant, the planting of his grandfather's flag 
on Mars. And I asked him, do you want to take your granddad's flag to Mars? He said, yes. At the time, I think he was 12 or 13. Doing illustrations for different um, concepts, engineering studies, I asked the engineer, what would the motorhome look like? He said, a Humvee with a roll cage and tank treads. I said, wow, that's, that's so big and lunky, you're going to need a little dune buggy to get around. He goes, oh, that's a good idea. So, But the canyons of Mars, um, different ideas uh, that were exciting. Uh, using a passive thermal cooling fin. Here she's wearing this on her spacesuit. It collapses if you jump in a rover, things like this. So this notion of drawing up these concepts. But I really wanted to um, pour my heart out in these illustrations because I wanted to be there. In some ways, I still want to be there. And that, that continues into the current work. But this sense of this new world, I think we all think about going abroad, going to somewhere new. In the case of Mars, we're really talking about a challenge, a challenge of our generation, our generations, essentially, if we're going to go. But also, the idea of tragedy on Mars, um, that uh, things happen, and that you have to deal with them. You're far away, and just as the pioneers of the past have had to deal with tragedy, so will we on these new worlds. Looking at these different engineering concepts and drawing them up are possible. They change all the time. Engineering ideas, our knowledge, goes way uh, into how we can design these things. But I started the Hayden Planetarium uh, when, uh, when I was about 10 years old. My mom used to drive me in, and I would go to the classes there. And when I heard, when I was doing those drawings, that the museum was going to change the Hayden Planetarium as built in 1935 into the current Rose Center for Earth and Space, uh, I was aghast. I thought, wow, you know, how can they tear down the planetarium where I grew up? But I had the chance to join this facility in doing something new. And what it afforded was the ability to, not, to go from a starry ceiling to actually taking you to place. Here I am pointing out the landing site of Apollo 15 to Paul, one of our video engineers. And we can literally fly over what is data, but it's our measurements of these other worlds that really take us there. What you're seeing here in this movie is the results of our missions to Mars and how we can assess that, and we're looking at it robotically. Uh, one of my students uh, that I oversee um, from a Swedish university, Lynn Shipping University in Sweden, um, I love his quote. He says he loves Mars because it's the only planet that we know of completely inhabited by robots. <laughs> and those robots are, are us. There are things. And no one's gone there yet. But they've gotten these tremendous images. The image you see in the movie is a reconstruction in a way. It's a, we're taking the mapping. It's an incredible mosaicing mapping. And that's put together in multiple colors to get the color. And then we put that together in computer graphics. We add the atmosphere. And we're doing this all guided by the science. But still, that little kid that was building a, a, the uh, clay dinosaurs, myself, it's my desire and will to sort of be there and see it. Here we get even closer. We're looking at mapping of Mars that goes down to six meter resolution. It's uh, like to say it's bigger than a car and smaller than a house. About this, every pixel in this map, it's about five terabytes for what we have, just the image. And we put that, drape that over terrain that was generated by, from a laser altimeter. But, all that information, one pixel is about the size of a two-car garage. And so if there are any two-car garages on Mars, I'm going to have seen them by now, but in any event, uh, what you do see is uh, the landscape and the sand dunes. This was recorded flying over Mars in the Hayden Planetarium. And then uh, after that, uh, took the flight path and set it to render. You can also see things like seams and mosaics. We have somewhat of an incomplete picture. So we build this up over time. Different things are brought in. And, but it allows us, through this ability, to take, again, the data and all the science and the engineering, but to construct it to have a sense of place, what Mars actually really looks like. And we're getting closer and closer in doing this. And so that um, from this data, we have even higher resolution data. And, uh, but a, but this, this sense of being able to fly over it is really, we're looking at landscape. And as artists across the ages have painted landscapes, it's a meditation on a place. You look and you aesthetically choose you know, your composition 
of what is pleasing. You know, artists is seated looking this way, perhaps not that way, or that way, not this way. And so in this way, the data becomes this template by which, in the form of what natural history museums have done throughout time, is show the context of, say, specimens and their location, and really concentrate on place. So Mars as a subject um, involves a lot of this science, a lot of this engineering, a lot of this planning, a lot of these dreams of humanity. And to see it ever closer is really something that I don't think will ever really be answered until we've set foot on Mars, perhaps. But in that, uh, what we can do is take these things and put them together. And um, we'll leave one other video coming up in a second that brings us down what we were looking at there was six meter resolution. This is 25 centimeter resolution, it was a quarter meter. This imagery, while not as widespread across the surface, are areas that look at first uh, for landing site verification of nice smooth areas. This is not smooth. Um, the little hills that you see here, each are about a football field wide, maybe about uh, um, a couple hundred feet tall. And what we're seeing, this terrain looks sort of almost like eroded wood. And what we're seeing basically are fine layers of terrain that have been built up and then subsequently eroded by the winds on Mars over billions of years. And uh, in this particular case, and what we're just looking at here, is that we're looking at an area that uh, has been basically built up in the center of one of the canyons on Mars, Candor Chasma. And um, what we do to construct this image is that we contextualize it by surrounding it with what you just saw and putting that together. These terrains are created through elaborate process of using stereo imagery. And from the stereo imagery, they can be analyzed to give us the height and information. And uh, our US Geological Survey in Flagstaff, Arizona, actually creates these terrain models. But what surrounds it, we take the raw materials, put that together. And my high school students from Bergen County Academies I've been working with for the past 10 years have taken that and have aided doing the surrounding terrain for us. In this case, we don't have the atmosphere yet. What you're seeing is sort of a work, a product in development. Um, but in this ability is we're getting down closer and closer to where we can actually come down right to the rovers themselves. And uh, so this ability to see what's close up, and I can tell you the scale and, and tell you that these hills are about a football field wide, but it makes you appreciate that the mountains in the back are about as tall as the Rocky Mountains straight up from sea level. If you go see the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, you're starting off from a, a plane that's already 5,000 feet high, one mile, mile high city, Denver. And then you see these mountains that climb up another 10,000 feet. In this case, you're seeing about 15 to 20,000 feet straight up from the base of this valley. Mars is known for having this, this tremendous landscape on a body, on a world that's only half the size of Earth. Um, it holds an atmosphere, it's a thin atmosphere. And really, on the surface of Mars, about seven millibars, and landers and the rovers, and that's equivalent to about where our atmosphere, we see almost going black above our planet. And that's really where the atmosphere starts. So you need a spacesuit on Mars. So in this reconstruction, our latest work has to do, and we are NASA funded on this, it's called Open Space. It's an open source so that everyone can share in this. And we want to share this with classrooms all around the world. Let's come down closer. And this was just filmed yesterday for correspondence with a team at NASA that's doing a similar thing, is we're coming down to the landscape surrounding the rover. And we see this, these sort of stretch views looking out at the landscape. We come right down to where the rover is. And so we're seeing the rocks around the rover. And there's a little white line that shows the history and the path of the rover and this sort of thing. But it's actually allowing us now to come down and view this. You're seeing this on a single screen, but this will be projected on the planetarium. What the planetarium does is if you imagine this view, you stretch your arms out, is that I, you know, my arms go into peripheral vision, I can't see, but in here I have this hemisphere of view. And so the planetarium becomes sort of a, a surrogate of your, of your view space. And so the 
ability to take us in information to many different realms that we can measure by science is what the planetarium offers. And in this case, take us to Mars. And that we see the terrain. One thing that is crucial here is that we're really seeing what it looks like. And when we show this to people, there's been a reaction that I've been having more and more. So I like to perhaps call this talk the Confessions of a Martian. Uh, <laughs> but it's a reaction that I see when we share this uh, with people in the dome. Um, and especially sort of on evenings where I grab people and we come in. We're unbounded by time. We can float over Mars for hours, literally. Sometimes we play music or have uh, musicians come and play. But people say there are no trees. There's no water. It's frozen. It's very thin atmosphere. This is the most Earth-like place in the solar system. And we consider perhaps, you know, this is our goal. It's something that I've thought about my whole life. This is my student, uh, Michael Holstrom, and together with uh, Richard Lindstedt, uh, are working on this. But we're also, in this new software, doing something else. We're looking here at the Earth with, uh, this is from a Japanese satellite, the MORE 8 weather satellite and uh, that we're looking every 10 minutes in color, which is somewhat unprecedented. This started about two years ago. It's now joined by the GOES-16 satellite, similar. Going to Mars, really, in my mind, I feel that I've done this. And so here's a close-up. We see dual storms off the coast of Southeast Asia. And we can see the outline here of the, of the uh, shorelines. But the thing is about Mars is it really makes you appreciate this biosphere that's here. If we go to Mars, and I have no question that one day people will, we are forever from this planet. This is the planet that we can live and breathe. I feel that my interest in Mars is really to be able to see it ever better and better, which we're committed to doing at the museum, for myself, has really made me fall in love with this planet that perhaps I was so eager to abandon to go to another. And I do think in the future, those who will spend amounts of time off this planet will really appreciate the beauty of where they're coming from. And so, if anything, all the colors, the palette, the artist's palette, all of that that goes into um, what we think of as beauty is something that is here on Earth. And we see it just inverted when we step away from it and look back at it as a paradise, really, in space. We may find other planets that have life out there, but we will forever be from this place. And this place is a jewel in the universe and a place that we must appreciate and must take care of. Thank you.